Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's continuation of the Helen Baird Montgomery Conference, part of this lecture week at CRCBS. It is my pleasure to be the one that gets to introduce this afternoon's panel to you. My name is Cindy Weaver, and I am a member of the advisory board for the Program of Study of Women and Gender in Church and Society here at Fiscal Gate, Rochester. And it has been a delight to be on that, and I am just tickled to be able to introduce this group to you. Starting on your left and going to your right, we're in Greek class, not Hebrew. Uh, we have Ms. Cynthia Harriet Sullivan. She is retired from the Rochester Police Department after 19 years, I believe, rising to the rank of lieutenant there. She has received the W Award from Rochester Women's Network. You've also been a security officer at the University of Rochester, I believe. And you are currently, she is currently, the chair of the Unite Rochester Justice Engagement Panel. And you may have noticed her guest guest essay in the uh, September 21st Rochester Democratic Chronicle. Um, the, one of her projects is organizing the recent uh, Unite Rochester Court Academy, and the purpose of this academy is to provide those who attend it with a better understanding of the criminal justice system in the hopes of addressing any misconceptions that may have led to uh, great discord in the past. So she's addressing current issues I was at the U of R when I was in high school. Oh, oh, no, no, no. You have Sister Barbara to thank for that. Uh, uh, I did it. I did it. Ah. Uh, continuing on, we have uh, Ms. Jamie Sa Saunders, who is the CEO of Alternatives for Battered Women. It provides services for any victim of domestic violence, female or male, no matter what age. You, you are the service for this county. And I believe, and it's said that you are celebrating 35 years now, and that's an interesting word to use for a program such as this, because of course we need it, and it is good to have it. It's just disconcerting that there is still a need. For 35 years, and again, this, this program, Alternatives for Battered Women is for all victims, all those who are affected by the abuse. Uh, previously, she has held executive positions at St. Joseph's Villa, at the Center for Governmental Research, and has been a vice president at Food Link. It's quite a varied career there. Welcome. <laughs> to her left is Dr. Beth Gearhart. She's a, prof a professor of theology and social ethics at Northeastern Seminary here in Rochester and is an adjunct professor at Roberts Wesleyan College. Her most recent book, I believe you've had more than one, or am I misreading things? <laughs> and, and her most recent uh, is The Cross and Gender Side. The subtitle is A Theological Response to Global Violence Against Women and Men. And in it you will find a very reformed theological approach to why the church needs to respond to this. The church does not have the luxury of saying this does not matter to us. I recommend the book. And then we have we have former uh, police department chief James Shepherd. He's now retired. Some of you may have seen him you know, as a familiar face for reasons I won't ask about. <laughs> he has been a member of the Rochester Police Department since 1981. He's worked in the Highland section, in the Clinton section, and in special investigations. He became deputy chief in 2006. He was appointed chief by Mayor Duffy. Final comment I have about him is an interesting one because it says he is now working, among other places, at the Center for Youth Services. So we know that he continues to lead an active life of service. 
on the, the concept, of, the concept, excuse me, on the fact of the exploitation of women. From my vantage point, here are my thoughts about the exploitation of women. And after five minutes, the mic will be passed to the next person. Once you've all had a chance, we're going to ask you to engage each other in the discussion of what each of you may have said. If you have questions or things you'd like to clarify or respond to, and at that point, we'd also ask Edwina, who I did not mean to neglect. Uh, uh, to join in on the discussion. <laughs> and when they have completed that, we'll turn it, open it up for questions and answers from uh, you folks. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. should have been per prosecuted for that, not necessarily, but my goal was to try to fix the problem with the best resources I had, and that meant that if they went through drug court and co completed successfully, then the charges would be you know, expunged at the end of the process. But the real issue was the addiction. A lot of them were girlfriends, wives, and what I was surprised is husbands and boyfriends didn't necessarily know that they were selling themselves on the side for money, which was kind of sad. Um, but that brought me to the attention of the National Drug Court Institute. Um, they offered me a job. I actually had been offered it for a few years, but I could walk out of my pension. And the chef understands that. You don't walk away from a you know, pension like that. So I figured they'd forgotten about me. But at that point, uh, then I was recruited to be their deputy director. So I worked in DC for several years. Um, and literally went around the country and outside of the country teaching court systems how to work, work more effectively with their um, resources. And that meant that if you've got a problem in your system, whether it's addicts, um, or prostitution driven, um, that your court process should have an impact on that. Like you can't have um, major issues around um, a theft from prescription drugs, but in your court process, all you do is address really, your, most of your resources go towards addressing people who use marijuana or sell it in the corner. I mean, it, you know, you're not gonna impact your problem that way. So, that literally started me on this process. Well, and then, to speed forward, I couldn't talk my husband into moving to D.C., so here I am, back in Rochester. But love it, always did. Uh, but that started me on a path of not just saying that I like policy and I like impacting it, but I also um, was able to fill the need that I, I couldn't stand redundancy and wasted effort. I, if we're going to do something, let's do it with the goal that it's really going to be able to fix a problem. And so I'm just, I brought that back here um, to do the best I can with Rochester. You've seen a little bit about the um, court academy. 
that that goal mainly for Unite is to look at issues of disparity, whether it's gender, uh, racial, um, that we want everyone to be receiving equal treatment and a fair uh, process throughout the criminal justice system. So, and I'm going to turn this over to Kate. just thank uh, the committee and Betty and this, this fabulous event that you've put together. Um, it, it really is something special to have a group this large who wants to come and talk and hear about something that most run away from. So again, thank you for being here as, as we shine the light. And Edwina, that was you know so fabulous to hear what you talked about and how it's understandable that we want to turn away from the ugly and run away from the darkness. Uh, and here you are running to the light. So I, I'm deeply appreciative of that. Um, as my eight-year-old says, you just really filled my bucket, so thank you for that. Um, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, uh, so it's also very appropriate that this is the topic that you are um, to, that you chose to speak about. Uh, I have the privilege of running Alternatives for Battered Women, and we are the only certified domestic violence provider in this area. So we are the one that Monroe County partners with, so if a family has domestic violence, if they are in need of shelter, of counseling, of support, of going through the court process, ABW is the resource. Uh, we are a small but mighty uh, nonprofit organization based on the goodwill of the community. As we're here together today in our shelter, which is in an undisclosed location, we have 22 women and 18 children there today, Phil, we're 40 bed shelter. Today we will have 30 individuals, 30 families go through the Hall of Justice meeting with an ABW court advocate to obtain an order of protection. That's 30 today, we have over 2,000 a year. We will receive over 40 calls to our hotline today. 40 calls to our hotline today. Many of you probably have seen the video of Ray Rice and the NFL and all the exposure that that has had. Our calls to our hotline have doubled since that tragic incident was exposed. An example of when we shine the light, people step forward. So the only benefit I can see out of that tragedy and that horrific video is that more people have resonated with that and are stepping forward. <coughs> this morning, we were with 100 students in Rush Henrietta teaching them about healthy relationships, about what abusive relationships are. As national studies show, one in five of our tweens, tweens, 12 to 17, will actually experience dating violence, our young people. And then 20 other women, as well as men, will receive counseling and support services from ABW today. So we are out there on the front lines, and so when we ask this question from my vantage point, uh, what does the exploitation of women mean, uh, it was very fortifying and filling my bucket to hear of the stories that, that resonated so much of the complexities that, of the people who come to us. People don't just come to ABW, they escape to us. And that is the complexities of what is happening in their lives. And yes, there can be complications with substance abuse, and you can understand the self-medication, because they have lived through such trauma and horrors. Many have experienced sexual child abuse. Many have experienced <coughs> bouts of prostitution. Many have, again, not had the opportunities that others have in this community. So when I think about the exploitation of women, what I think about is that we all lose. We all lose, and there's been studies all across the, the world about when women are educated and women are treated as equals, everybody wins. There's increases in all the positive measures that you want. So we all lose, and you know this in the city of Rochester, but also in Monroe County. I'd be remiss that I would not at least draw the attention that this is not an urban problem. It's in every zip code. While just over half of our clients at Alternatives for Battered Women are from the city, just under half, 48% are from our suburbs and rural communities. We all know somebody. Whether we are aware of it or not, one in four women, one in seven men will be a victim of domestic violence. That's in this country, that's in this county, this is in your congregation, at the supermarket, on the street. So I think of how we all lose with the low education rates in this community, we all lose by the low literacy levels, we all lose by the high infant mortality rates where there are developing nations that have healthier babies than we do right here. We all lose. So when I think about that women make 80 cents to the dollar of our male counterparts, 
When I think about how we can view women and girls still as property, and here we are 20 years after the Violence Against Women Act was passed. It's the 20th anniversary of O.J. Simpson, if you remember. It's the 20th anniversary of the Violence Against Women Act. That is when we were actually defining domestic violence and sexual assault as a crime. It took New York State until 1983 to outlaw marital rape. It was, a, it was a man's a husband's right to property. And as you know, just this past spring, 275 Nigerian schoolgirls were kidnapped. The relevance of that overseas to here in our backyards is immense. It's immense. It's right here in our backyards. So ABW, we most certainly provide services for any and all members, so I appreciate that our name had a very specific purpose out of the 70s and the feminist movement of calling something that nobody wanted to talk about what it is, battered women. But we also know there are male victims and male survivors, so we do provide services for everyone. Sex workers, prostitutes, human trafficking in Monroe County is also, unfortunately, quite a large problem that we have. So we are there for all of those. So what can be done? What can be done? I think first and foremost that, of course, we want to be there to respond. So victim service agencies like ABW, of course, with supporting organizations like ours and others who are doing this work, like Atlanta's great organization, supporting response is important. But we have to go upstream, and we have to talk to our young people. And unfortunately, that's not where the public dollars and our resources go. We're not upstream, and that's where we need to be. Engaging men and young men in particular, and I hope Chief Shepard will talk about that. He does some fabulous work right now with our young men about that, because this is a human issue. It's not just a woman's issue or a young girl's issue. And stopping consumption. This is hard. We're actually waging a battle against consumption. Right, so how do we make it so that the demand isn't there so the supply isn't there? We talk about that with prostitution, we talk about that in the media. You know, I have young nieces and nephews in the video games that they're watching where they're actual violence against women. And there's even these secret codes that you can put in to unlock a whole other part of the video games where it's just horrific. So we have to make sure that the consumerism is in check, that we're not there to support all of this violence against women and we stand up against that as a human rights issue. And our faith leaders have a critical role. We've had many women who said it was so hard for them to leave because they feel like they have to break a pact with their faith. They have to break a pact with their God. And that is not what it's about. And that's where we need to partner and do a better job to make sure that we're meeting the spiritual needs of those who take that step forward into the light. And I have young children, so I'll close with this. Um, and particularly a young daughter, she's six years old. And every night when I tuck her into bed, and of course, as her mother, I think she's the most beautiful thing on the planet. And I'll tell her that. And I'll, I'll hug her and I'll kiss her and I say, I love you, you're beautiful. And then I always follow it up with, and you're smart, and you're intelligent, and you're kind, and you're funny, and you can be anything you want to be. It can't stop just at the aesthetics. She needs to be as empowered as any other person on the planet. So, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. I appreciate you standing up for this important issue. Massachusetts, I was director of Better Women's Shelter for about 15 years. And one of the first calls I remember receiving was from a pastor in town. I was new to that area. Um, so I didn't know church leaders there, um, who's who. Um, and he called me and he said, I know one of the members of my church is in your shelter. And I want you to know, I realize you're not a Christian because you people are breaking up families in this community. And I, let him, I remember having to hold the phone away from my ear because his, he was yelling. Um, so when I let him go on, and when he finished, I said, actually, I am a Christian, and that's why I do the work I do. And I went on to have a conversation with him really about who is this God that we both say we worship. I said, the God I have does not want women to be staying in homes and being beat up. You know, to me, that keep the family together at all costs is really a type of idolatry. Right? Kind of a doormat theology. Um, so that really started my journey. I, and I had come out of, got my MSW, not one course on domestic violence, and I'm thrown out in the community. Um, I had gotten 
unfortunately, other really great training on the subject, but not through um, school. He had a master's degree in theology and, you know, no talk really about domestic violence and um, encountering pastor after pastor who didn't have training. So I had started a ministry just to do some training with pastors in the area. And listening to them talk about, well, if I told, you know, someone that she should stay in and keep the marriage together and hearing their stories and working with women um, who, as Jamie, you know, referred to, would stay in the home because of really poor biblical teaching, right? Um, and I used to say, those are my more difficult audiences, unfortunately, sometimes Christian audiences rather than more secular audiences because I had to really unpack all of what they had learned around submission and all of the perversion of uh, scripture, um, which really uh, got my goat to say nicely. Um, so I got a little bit of a mission, went back up to school in Boston to really integrate social ethics, social justice with theology. Um, the great school of uh, Howard Thurman and Martin Luther uh, King, Boston University. So I um, was able to really um, have a lot of support around integrating issues around violence and, and becoming more interested in global perspective, global violence, um, and also church response and a theological response to that. So it's kind of many years in building until um, the book um, came out in the, in the spring. It's actually, the subtitle, just to correct the uh, introduction, is in Violence Against Women and Men, uh, Against Women and Girls. Uh, because I think that is, those are our most vulnerable uh, populations uh, globally, certainly. So, you know, where I'm coming from in terms of my perspective is I think, by and large, a church, um, when they do respond, it's a partial response. Right? So we have October's Domestic Violence Month, so we might have a speaker come into church, or maybe even form a committee, or let, let's get educated about this. And that's all wonderful. Let's do a fundraiser, maybe for ABW or um, other um, agencies. That's wonderful. But it's a partial response. The church often responds to these issues kind of in a moral, maybe, framework. And I would argue, I think it's a confessional issue. I think we need to use the language that speaks to the reality. It's a type of genocide. You know, I use the language of, gen I'm not the first to use it, gender side, because that's what it is uh, globally. Millions of women and girls are trafficked every year. Millions of girls and women have undergone female genital mutilation, have had mandated sex elective abortions, right? 16%, for example, in China of the population of females is missing as they reach adulthood uh, from the one-child policy. Um, acid burnings, kidnappings, it goes on. You know, it's unfortunate, the week that the, the book came out in May was the same week that there was a lot of national press around the kidnapping of the girls in Nigeria, right? We had the Bring Back Our Girls whole thing. Um, and I thought, and I must have gotten a dozen requests for radio, national radio interviews and all that. And you know, you get into these, Interview saying, well, oh, they're off. It, it's horrible what happened uh, to the girls. It happens every day, it happens every week. So, raising consciousness in the church beyond Domestic Violence Month, um, beyond setting up committees, looking at it, this is a response that a response we need to have that uses the language of gender side. This is a type of Holocaust that goes on. Um, and to use theological language and call it for what it is, it's sin, and to hold accountable those um, perpetrators of the sin. You know, I liken it also to, and I would recommend um, also uh, Nicholas Kristoff and Sherilyn Dunn's book, if you haven't um, heard that, Half the Sky, Turning Oppression into Opportunities for Women, and they have a great website, and their film series was on PBS last year, um, and they have wonderful uh, statistics and <coughs> ways of, of really connecting with this. But, you know, all of the, whether it's domestic violence here, or, you know, sex trafficking going on in Africa, wherever, it all has its same roots, right? Of misogyny, um, oppression, domination, objectification of women and girls, billion dollar pornography. It's all rooted um, in, in the same roots. And that's, I think, you know, uh, as Mina mentioned, Last I was able to be here this morning about the systematic 
nature of violence against women. That's what the church needs to counter. And I think, you know, seeing that definition um, and the church realizing you have to go beyond our committees or our consciousness raising, all that's necessary. But we need to really go deeper. We, we need to talk about our collusion with violence. You know, our lack of repentance for our silence over the years. For our lack of resistance and activism of stopping Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I, I really love his work and I, I think he's a great kind of example of, I, I bring that a lot into this work, because when he talks about the church's response to institutional evil, he talks about there needs to be three responses. One is you break the silence, right? You speak truth to power, the church has a prophetic call. Second is to aid victims. We need to provide shelter, we need to provide resources. But the third I think is the most difficult, for the church is resistance to institutional evil. And that means getting engaged politically. That means making yourself vulnerable, right? To criticize, <coughs> moving out of our comfort zones. Um, and, but I think that is the only way to really attack more institutional um, and systemic um, evil. You know, Bonhoeffer said, church, in this, his famous <coughs> sermon, I love this, he said, in his frustration, I think, Church be the church because of the, you know, the criticism he and the confessing <coughs> church had. You know, be the church. So he, there's two questions. In every generation, Christians have to ask themselves, who is Jesus Christ for us today? And then what follows from our Christology is our ecclesiology, right? Then we can say, then what is the role for the church today? What's the mission of the church? But we better really have the discussion of who we do believe Jesus Christ is for us today. Do we believe that he is with the oppressed? Do we really believe that he loves the marginalized and he identifies with those who have been cast away? If we believe that, then that's where we need to stand as church, right? Um, you know, Martin Luther came with it. <coughs> about the church being too often being the tail light instead of the headlight for justice. And I think in this air, area for the 21st century, and that's the argument that Chris Christoph makes too in his book, is this is, this is the issue for the 21st century, is the treatment of women and girls, is gender side. And we really, I think as church, need to come together and find um, have these deal discussions about who do we see God is today and then what's the mission of the church. And if we believe that that's the work for today then, then we better get on the ball, right? And then we need to, to really come together and um, form some solutions that also move beyond um, breaking silence, aiding victims, and provide uh, resistance. What Walter Brueggemann calls forming alternative uh, communities, courageous communities. Thanks so much. How are we doing this afternoon? The only reason I agreed to come do this is because I knew we had a short COVID. <laughs> That's my perspective for being a policeman for 33 years. When I started in this job, that's how we handled domestic violence incidents. Mm -hmm. We'd receive a call, we'd go to the house, it was usually the female who was abused. We'd ask what they wanted us to do. Generally they wanted him to leave. He'd leave, we'd leave, and we'd go through this cycle once or twice a week. Since that time, a lot of things have changed. I know on a personal level, it's something that I would not tolerate. Taking the time to find out what is the background story? What has been going on in this household? What is going on with this family? 
there are a ton of resources that we can make available to uh, someone in crisis that historically we did not do. One of the things I noted as chief, there was a period of time that 20 to 25 percent of our homicides were domestic violence related. And when we went to the backstory, we'd see, oh, they've only called the police 150 times in the past year. We could have prevented that. That's one of my perspectives. In terms of crime, and Cindy talked about it relative to prostitution. And I worked in a unit that dealt with arresting prostitutes. We ran details. We'd arrest 150 prostitutes in a year, maybe two or three jobs, and that, took, that tells you who we thought was a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And for every one of those women we arrested, we figured they should have went to jail for at least five years. And the reality is they were being exploited. A lot of times it was based on a love relationship, based on an addiction, based on manipulation. And we always felt, if you didn't want to be in this business, why don't you just get out? If you call the police because you're involved in a domestic violence situation, well, why don't you leave? And the reality is, everybody can't leave. Everybody's not in a position to leave. They have children. They're psychologically manipulated. There's so many things going on that they're counting on us. That's why they call 911, for somebody to help them. And sometimes it takes someone to guide them to the proper resource. Jamie talked about people don't go to ABW. They escape. And that's the role of law enforcement, really, to facilitate that escape. And sometimes it's encouraging them, saying, you know what? This is the third time I've been here. What can we do to help you get out from under this situation? Currently, what I do is I work at the Center for Youth, the New Beginnings Program, which is a program for young males, 9th through 12th grade. One of our most recent discussions was about Ray Rice. Anybody seen this video? Interesting and sad at the same time is how they felt about it. Because some of our young men were disgusted. Some of our young men were, well, it depends on what she did. And some of them felt she got what she deserved. And so our debate was, one, what it is to really be a man. Because for me as a man, I don't think there's a woman that can make me mad enough to hit them. I think as a man, part of my role, or any man in this room, is to help young men develop so that they don't see that as an option you have a dispute, particularly with female. Other things that have happened um, since I became a policeman is we have mandatory arrest policies, in which the state is mandated that under certain circumstances, we will make an arrest. And if the um, perpetrator can be identified, we will make that arrest so that it is in a situation where it's this revolving door of someone calling, calling, and us doing nothing and nothing. Another thing that I think has impacted the exploitation of women in my time, your time, is the internet. Because a lot of these issues that we deal with with young girls is on the internet. You don't have to walk the street anymore. You post a video. You advertise on the internet. Someone will call you. Someone will uh, inbox you. And you'll make that connection. And there's men who are manipulating these women by videotaping them, taking the pictures, and advertising them. And so that's something that we have to make the adjustment to address. Because we can go out and do prostitution arrest, run up and down Lyle Avenue, but that's really not touching the problem in terms of how widespread it has become. There was a little talk about the kidnapped girls in Africa. And the thing that has bothered me since then, since Ray Rice, even since Adrian Peterson, is our short attention span. Yes. We will have an incident, we'll have an event, and we'll 
we'll all get up in arms. Then a couple weeks will pass, and we forget about it. So I would say that, you know, as a result of uh, having this opportunity to speak today, um, the subject matter is uh, dear to my heart, that not just listening to us speak, but do what you can to have some impact. Now what have I done? How do you like my shoes? Because this past weekend, I uh, participated in the ABW Walk a Mile in Her Shoes. <laughs> and these ain't it. <laughs> uh, basically, I wore a pair of high heel go go boots. Uh, but the point was not so much fashion. But the point I'm making is that it's all about doing something so that we do make a difference. Thank you. I'd like to ask the panel members and Edwina to talk among yourselves. Uh, but actually, if, if uh, one of the difficulties of being a panel member is you may not have a chance to say everything you'd like, or you may want to respond to what somebody else has said, so we'd like to hear what you would be saying to each other as though you were in a quiet corner at a cocktail party or something. Please go ahead and uh, let us hear what you Okay. Since I went first, can I start first? Okay. All right, I want in on this. Okay, um, and some of you are going to get mad at me, so I'll, I'll give my disclaimer up front, but I believe strongly in a woman being empowered to make her own choices. And that also to me means, um, I'm not sure, um, but if, if a woman fully informed, um, not approaching it through any sort of trauma. I remember your comments earlier. But if she's fully informed and as an adult decides she wants to be a sex worker, then as far as I'm concerned, that's her business. Um, the, and looking at domestic violence, um, I have mixed feelings of not the issue of m m domestic violence, but we hear about you know wearing uh, pink for breast cancer. And I've, I've looked at the stats as far as how much of that money actually goes to the uh, Cancer Society, and how many millions actually go to the uh, manufacturers and to the NFL. So, you know, I won't put you on the spot about that, but I look at things like wearing purple. I think it's a good way to call attention, but I also know at the end of the day, if you're doing what you need to do, if you're leading by example, um, if the NFL players are, and the employees are literally exhibiting the kind of behavior that they want their players to do, um, then purple's not going to be necessary. Um, because you're just going to do what needs to be done. And um, so I, I, my, my challenge on that also, and I know we talked a little bit about um, the religious aspects of it. Um, we had worked with a Y to start this program called uh, Helping Others, Promoting Excellence, or Hope Enterprise. And that was specifically for a voice for women where if they can't go to their clergy person, but they're dealing with issues, because I know this whole politics of the church, it shouldn't be, but sometimes it does exist. But we want them to have that option. Um, so when I hear about exploitation, I agree with that. I also think even you know the pundits talk about this whole rice uh, issue. But as I'm watching that, I, I felt for the wife, because I thought, you've got all these people weighing in mm -hmm. on her life. Yes. You know, it's her decision. <coughs> and I, literally, I was yelling at the television. My husband told me to calm down. But <laughs> it's her decision. I mean, she, it should be an informed one. I like the issue of dealing with sisterhood first, because a friend of mine told me uh, a while ago, She's, she's a psychiatrist. I wouldn't see her, but not that that's, there's anything wrong with that. I, I do believe in you know, going for therapy when you need it, but we were just friends. And she told me, Cindy, you know, there are two kinds of women. Um, some ones that keep men's secrets and one that keeps women's secrets. And I didn't necessarily get where she was coming from with that. Um, uh, but over the years, I've come to understand what she means as far as that sisterhood. And, and I, as you were talking, Edwina, that's when it hit me, really, that when you bring the women in and deal with the sisterhood issues, as someone who's following a pimp, they've been keeping the men's secrets. 
and you turn them into women that keep women's secrets. So I will applaud you for that. Uh, but I, I, and lastly, on, on what Shep mentioned, um, I, I do give him a lot of credit because there are different ways that I know as a chief and even in law enforcement doesn't necessarily get credit for the little ways. It's the little things. Um, and the little ways I would see him where as I'm the lieutenant, another male uh, manager might come in and go start speaking to the officers that report to me, like I'm not even in the room, but he would never do that. And it's those little things that matter. And so when we talk about how we're gonna change it, 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 I think for every one of us in here, it means taking a look literally at our own behavior. So I know I've thrown it out to all of you, uh, but you know, you can have right back at it. <laughs> Well, let me agree with you that wearing purple isn't the answer, but, um, and actually I think my purple scarf, I've been wearing purple all month because it's October, so my scarf's over there. It's really a conversation starter. Yes. Um, okay. So I, I do hope that Sorry. the NFL starts to wear purple so that when my six-year-old daughter is sitting or watching the NFL, because we still watch it, not all NFL players are bad. Actually, the majority come off the field and they don't beat their wives. So we watch at the NFL and purple is a conversation starter. My kids mm -hmm. ask me about the pink, and so we talk about that. Um, but it's not enough, and I think that actually goes to your point that having events just for Domestic Violence Month is not enough, but it's a start. So the public safety building is purple this month, the library is purple this month, you know, the city hall is purple this month, and we hope it's a conversation starter to talk about what can be very uncomfortable. Um, and then I think in terms of, uh, as we all look at the Ray Rice story, so we've been following it, and there's a lot of judgment, and there's a lot of water cooler talk, and ride in the elevator, so people have all this judgment on the wife, because she was beaten when she was the fiance, she married him. So suddenly, this very private matter in her personal choices, we're all picking apart. They were you know, high school sweethearts, they have a child together, he makes 36 million, all this judgment, it doesn't matter. There's a very clear line, he is 260 pounds, he hurt this woman visibly. Did she push him for it? Doesn't matter. There was choices there, and they were the wrong ones. Then we talk about the NFL. Do they have a role to make a judgment? Do we, as private employers, are we responsible for our employees' behavior when they're not with us? The NFL is a nonprofit organization. People know that? <laughs> they're a nonprofit organization. And even if they weren't, they, they have a very visible role in our this temperature check for our culture. So they are held in a different standard. They just are. So it is a stand of if they are taking responsibility and actually modeling the behavior of what is good and, and not good behavior. Uh, that is just critical. And in terms of, I, I just, I love I love hearing any time, and I would still call you Chief, Chief Shepherd, because he will always be, but he's exemplary. He uh, models behavior for these young men. Uh, he, he wore pink go-go boots, which again, like her, it's a symbol. <laughs> Um, and on a meaningful way, you know, he did this last year too, he did a Chiefs Challenge, and having law enforcement come out for such a goofy event, uh, but it raises awareness and then it engages people. Uh, and last year, I've told this story several times, but a survivor walked many, many miles because she wanted to actually see the police chief. She couldn't believe the police chief was walking for her. So there's symbolism, there's meaning, and there's ways to have these conversations that are very impactful, but it has to be followed up with action. The only point I want to make is around the issue of accountability. Um, from at the end, you know, the NFL, that whole, <laughs> a lot of us, I guess, are screaming at our TVs. Um, <laughs> because I heard so many comments um, trying to almost find a way to make it okay. You know, that, well, I think she's been in a, her, a lot of victim blaming and the judgment and all of that. Almost like we don't want to pull out, hold someone accountable. Um, and that, and I ran better, and I co-led groups for a long time in Massachusetts, better intervention um, groups too. And in Massachusetts, you're, when you're arrested, you either go to jail or you go to pretty strict programming. It's 10 months long. Very, very accountable, constantly in contact with victims. You know, it's, it's a community-based program. Um, and at the end of those 40 weeks, I would say to guys, what, you know, helped the most? Almost always the guys would say, Getting arrested was the best thing that ever happened to me. They come whining because they had to, you know, they had to pay out of pocket for the groups. They couldn't use insurance. You know, it's all about accountability. 
they come into the program really whining. They call Massachusetts, what's called Massachusetts, it's ha ha, you know, because of how we favor women and all of that. But at the end of the day, after 10 months, it was all about accountability. Best thing that ever happened to me. You know, um, so I just, I think accountability is just, is, is huge. And as a society, I'm not sure, it's just the way we're socialized. It's, you know, we shy away from that or trying to make things okay. A probation officer once said to me, well, about, you know, the first time he's arrested, you want him to go to jail or go the first time? And my response back to him was, if he was caught robbing a bank, would you be saying, gee, should we arrest him? Because it's his first time robbing a bank. Come on. But we do that when, you know, beating up a woman. So he didn't have a response for me that day. But <laughs> it's a private matter. I think I heard that. <laughs> and I'm going to just say, I, you know, I, I hate that because First of all, I grew up in a home in which domestic violence was normal. And I, I want to make that key point, normal. Because that's what we're dealing with. When you have a situation where you grow up in an environment that that is normal, then that's what you become. And so, as men or boys, if in your home, that is the way situations are addressed, <coughs> disagreements are addressed, I come home intoxicated, and that's what I end up doing, as a young child, if that's what you see, the likelihood of you being the same thing is, is greatly increased. And so that's the key thing that we need to keep in mind is that it's, it's not about the NFL. Mm -hmm. You know, and all this conversation about Ray Rice isn't about the NFL, because it's not their responsibility to raise young men to be, or young boys to be men. I think it's great that the focus is there, but don't expect the fact that you take an athlete who is no different than I say, Pookie on the block, except for he's highly skilled athletically. And expect him to be the standard of America. That, that's it, that's wrong. Highlight the fact, state that it's wrong, but they should not be the ones that we say we fix the problem, because now the NFL addressed it. It's not an NFL problem, it's an American problem, we need to address that. And I'll go back to my point about the um, private matter. <clears throat> Women for so long, have believed. You take that woman, you shut your mouth, and you keep it in the house. That's wrong as well. I like you. <laughs> um, just a couple of responses. Um, we were talking about, I think someone said that addiction was a major problem, uh, fundamental uh, cause or, or, or involvement in prostitution. I was, I was just reflecting that, that of all the women that I've met and worked with uh, in the hundreds, only approximately 2% do not have an addiction problem. So 98% of the women I've known uh, in prostitution have an addiction. And I think, as I said earlier, that it's like you, you can't do this kind of thing if you're thinking, if you're in tune with what's really happening. You have to, you have to uh, shut up, shut out. You have to close down. Um, and, and then someone referred to how important it is to engage um, the church in this kind of thing, and you know, make, get the, our church leaders and institutions to speak up about the exploitation uh, of women. But of course, we have, in, particularly in the Catholic Church, a pervasive fear of sexuality, a pervasive fear of women. And to imagine our, well, so-called celibate men uh, standing up in our pulpits and talking about, you know, exploitation of women and prostitution, it's like, it, it's something, it's an, it's an arena, it's an area which they are already very fearful of. And when you look at, at the layers of exploitation, uh, battery and prostitution and pornography, that's all there. And there's also all kinds of other layers, and particularly from my own tradition, my uh, Catholic tradition, uh, we women are simply not even allowed to stand up like that 
and give a homily or preach in church. Uh, this, is, this is basic. How, how can we talk about getting our brothers to talk about prostitution and sexuality and battery uh, when they won't even allow a woman to speak in public? Um, I, I remember, this is very brief, uh, the first time I ever uh, was permitted to stand up in a church, as my own cathedral in, in England, uh, and I was, was 25, 24, something like that. And I, I was so, I, I was so, I'd been to Africa and I'd worked in Africa for, for three years in a village and I, I was so passionate about the poverty of these people who became my, my family. I wanted to tell people at home about it. And so I, I did beg my local pastor, please just let, let, me, let me give a little talk from the pulpit. And this was the first time in the history of the cathedral, which is over 100 years old, that a woman had ever got up into that pulpit. And I was terrified. Uh, and to check me out, the bishop came as well. It was a celebrated mass. So you've got three or four priests, and then you had the bishop there. And I had to come up um, from the, the congregation and walk in front of the bishop and the priests. And just before I got to the pulpit, the, the priest at the end here, who was the pastor, leaned forward and whispered to me, make it quick. <laughs> and that was the end of it. I got up in that pulpit as a young woman with my, with my brothers around me wanting to make it quick, and I couldn't speak. I was so terrified. I was so intimidated. And I stood there, and there are about 500 people in the cathedral. And I'm standing, and I'm looking, and I'm shaking. And do you know what I got from that congregation? It was, a, it was a, like a huge invisible swell of energy. It was like they were saying aloud, come on, come on, come on, you can do this, come on, come on, you can do this. We give you the authority to do this. And I felt... After, I, I, I must have been silent for at least two to three minutes. And then I felt the energy of these people, and that's, I was able to speak uh, and, and do my thing. Uh, but so, when we're, and this has not changed. Now, what, 40 years later, 45 years later, we're still not permitted, we Catholic women are not allowed to preach. So, we're talking about issues like exploitation, as I said, battery, prostitution, violence, uh, and yet we haven't even addressed a, a, a little bit the idea of equality in simple things like standing up and giving a speech. So we, we do have a long way uh, to go uh, in that. And I, I think for me, the change was, was I, I got so impassioned, I was so passionate about how I've been treated and, and still am, that that's what's an important element in making a difference, it's an important element in changing people's consciousness is that we have to feel passionate uh, about about these kinds of issues. And, and about half an hour ago, it's interesting, I was just fiddling around on my cell phone and I, I got a notice saying that tomorrow is the International Day of the Girl. I never heard of that before. Maybe it's new that we know that today out came the directory, uh, International Slavery Directory, and the director, and the tomorrow is International Girls' Day, when girls all over the world are invited to stand up. Now, what, what are your gifts? What are your talents? What a difference are you making in, the, in this, in your class, in your house, in your home, in your town, in your city? And it's international. I got so excited. I thought it was International Women's Day, International Girls' Day, you know, directory. So those are the, those are the things. Uh, that we hope for, but I do believe certainly my own uh, Catholic Church is uh, way behind, way behind in, in, in women's issues, and that's why I know in my tradition I am marginalized. I'll, I'll never be fully accepted in, in the Catholic Church because of my woman's voice about exploitation, including myself. Uh, just there you go. Voila. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
questions from the audience? Do, are there any other comments you questions you have of each other? Doesn't have to go in order. So why don't I open it up then and ask all of you folks? Speak up so that we can hear. President Carter just published a book called A Call to Action in which he says that the single largest issue on the globe is the exploitation of women across the globe. And he links it <coughs> to our tolerance for violence in general and says that if we tolerate domestic abuse, for example, okay, we're going to be less willing to stop wars and allow people to engage in all kinds of genocide and, and other things. In other words, it's a global culture that supports violence. And he names things like paintball and American tolerance for violent video games as all being part of the same cultural fabric. Now, on a feeling level, that feels absolutely overwhelming. And, and while we single out violence against women today, which is, which is great, we also need to name the fact that we got a cultural flaw. In the Catholic tradition, we talk about original sin. And there was a little wise nun that said, never bet against original sin. And that's exactly what we're up against, is a Achilles heel among human beings that we tolerate easily, violence. And that's, what need, that's where I think the churches need to step in and take a stand. And that's where I admire groups that do that, but it's disappointing in many denominations. So just your thoughts on Agree. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm actually pass it to you, but um, it's a choice. I think that's what it comes down to. And it's uh, uncomfortable to talk about, uncomfortable to think about. Uh, you know, I, again, I mentioned having young children, and I have, I would say, middle class privilege of when I get to expose them to these atrocities, mm -hmm. which is not the case of many people. Uh, so I have these thoughts. When do I tell my four year old about what is happening? Now, they know that I work at ADW. It took them a little while to understand what that means, but they come with me to the shelter. But it's, how, it's those moments in the car that we, at least I'm starting with the young people that are in my life and my nieces and my family members, that it's important. So yes, it's part of my day job, but as a, as a wife, as a mother, as an aunt, I have to have these conversations to chip away at the culture, and that's at least something that I can control. It can feel so overwhelming, and I think, you know, what Edwina said this morning about like digging a hole, you wanna put the paper over your head and just not think about it. Uh, I gotta tell you, when I'm at cocktail parties or Thanksgiving, people don't wanna talk about what I do. <coughs> it's, a, it's an easy way to get somebody to turn around. <laughs> uh, but it's important to have those conversations, and it's important to look it right in the eye, and uh, that's part of why I mentioned I'm so grateful that you are here walking into the darkness because you bring the light, and you really do. So it's not only just thanking you for being here, but the challenge is, who are the three people you're gonna to speak to about what you heard this week, right? What's the next step uh, about that tolerance, so. Yeah. I, I just wanna mention quickly that um, I, I don't think, and, and I don't really speak for everyone, but I, I think I can safely say we're all in agreement on that. But exploitation has so many different variables to it. Um, and like I said, I talk in terms about a woman being victimized in, in, in few ways, in a couple ways, not just by being a victim of domestic violence, but by in a case like the Rice case, uh, Rice case, <laughs> Rice case, is taking that and everybody weighing in on it. And, and it kind of lost, to me, you know, often it's about choices, like you said, um, but those are my choices. And at some point, it, although it's an informed one, I want that to be a part of the uh, equation. And we talk about the tolerance of violence, and I think, uh, and I still remember it like it was yesterday, but probably one of the most difficult things I dealt with is my uh, daughter, uh, I'm an only child, and uh, she has a student in school. Um, I, I won't call it a fight, um, but I'll say she was assaulted because another student, uh, another young lady, hit her in the face with a, a, um, a lock, a padlock. And, um, and um, so, like she's in her 30s, but now I'm about to cry even though 
you know, you know how long ago that was, but walking in that school, and you know, because I dropped everything, and walking in that school and seeing her face, I, you know, I just, and I think part of it was because when she saw me, I think if I lost it, then she really would have. So I knew I had to kind of suck it up a little bit. So I took her to the doctor, you know, she had to have some stitches. And I got to tell you, I still don't know to this day how I didn't just grab that little girl <laughs> by her neck. Uh, because in the few ways that I, I can lose my control, that's one of them. And I think for a lot of women as mothers, we can understand that. But we also understand that there's something within us that keeps us from stepping over that line. And for me, the only time I've ever had to really worry about that was then. So speed forward, we had a hearing for the school district. And it was this girl, her grandmother was raising her because her mother had some addiction issues she was dealing with and she wasn't raising her. And the school's attorneys and I. And um, so we had this discussion around how it happened and she just, I left that meeting, and I didn't think I ever would feel a little sorry for that young lady because she just seemed so angry. And I couldn't imagine, because um, that's not how I grew up without my mom and my mom. I mean, she was one of my biggest uh, fans. And she didn't have hers. And, and it, by the time we got done talking, it was almost as if she resented that my daughter did. Yeah. And, and, it, but for me, you know, I, it was really a first time to really come face to face with that. And we talk about these things in our violence tolerance. And whether you do or not, at the end of the day, it comes back to all of us. We can do all the right things, and yet these things still visit us. But um, I remember telling her, the young lady, that, you know, I understand that you're upset and you gone through a few things. I said, but you'll never hear, and I pointed to my daughter, I said, you will never hear her hurt somebody because she doesn't like what they have to say. And, and the profound part of, about that for me was that I knew that. There was no question in my mind. My daughter was, was not that kind of person. Uh, but at the same time, I think I was hurt for this girl because I knew that wasn't going to be her story. And how do we as we move forward. When I move forward and I work for Unite Rochester and some of the other programs, the Hope Enterprise, in my own way, I'm trying to avoid girls like that. Growing up, being angry young women who think they can hurt people uh, as a way to deal with their problems. So I put that out there. I know your question was about tolerance. I, 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 I think a lot of us don't, but when we get to what do we do part, is where we kind of, I think, get a little bit stuck. So I, I mentioned that so you know. You know, I had a great young lady. She's moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. She says she's not coming back here. <laughs> uh, but I mean, for opportunities. But I, I, I would see over and over again, and I'm sure that's been a, a, the cheeks for all call them chef, but is that you can go out and do all of those things you need to do, but it could still visit your home too. So to think that, I know somebody talked about us and them, and I agree with that, sometimes we get caught up in that. But you can be an us all you want, but at some point, them is gonna get you too. And I think we just have to keep that mindset. So. In terms of uh, churches, I think, you know, when I work with churches, I talk about looking at both the local and the global level. And I think there is real hope. You know, I think in the darkness, Keep that edge of light for us. It is so overwhelming. Um, so I think of, you know, even on the local level, I, when I started teaching at Northeastern Seminary about 11 years ago or so, there was no course on violence against women. It's one of the first things I said to the dean. You don't have a course? Like these, you know, they're getting out of here, going to churches. I don't know anything. And that's who's going to be walking in the office. And I said, we have to, have you know, so I've been teaching this course. And um, I think, well, at least. It's, it's not long enough, it's not enough, but it raises consciousness, they have resources, they know they can call me. And uh, last month, a student who went through that uh, program, and I integrate it throughout all my justice classes, and I get it in wherever I can, um, called me, and he's a pastor now in Pennsylvania, and he talked to me about 
a woman who came in um, who had been battered in his uh, church. And we were talking about that, and I said, well, you do, do you remember from the class? Do you have the number of your local better women's shelter here? And he said, I'm all alone down here. I'm new. Do you, have you met the director or counselor from the better women's shelter? Do you know who the legal advocate is in court? You're not alone. There's a network of people out there and experts. You don't have to do it all yourself. You know, so get get connected. Get connected. And he's like, oh, I forgot about all of it. Let me, let me do that. Let me do that, right? Um, I said, it's step one. Let's find out who your local resources are. Um, get numbers out there. Um, and even globally, um, so I've had parents who say, well, you know, I just, I don't think the global is really in our area. We just need to work. I said, no, no, you're the church of God. Global is our area, too. And it can be when you're working in one area. So if you're involved in microfinancing in a community, you help one woman start a little business, you know, in Africa or work on clean wells, or you work in one area, that's going to empower and impact her and maybe give her the ability then not to have to stay shamed in a relationship with stage, stay in no abusive relationship. So, if a clergy person is a it needs to be also held accountable, and I would work the same way. Did everybody get that question? Mm -hmm. Did you say that uh, Yeah, it was I, I, my question to her was, what if the clergy leader is the batterer? Mm -hmm. How do you address that, and what about the woman's options as far as, because literally when we talk about the whole enterprise, those are sometimes the issues. Politics of the church, no one's going to believe it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, d depending on circumstance, I mean, I, I counsel in the same way. I don't tell women what to do. I offer safety planning, alternatives, uh, give resources, call the police, you know. Um, I worked with a pastor's wife who said, you know, I went to the elders and, and told them what was happening. And they really didn't believe me. He's such a great guy. And then they caught him having an affair. And they kicked him out because of the affair. And she said to me, wow, that says a lot that because of the affair, they got rid of him. But it was basically OK that he was abusing me. She eventually went off with One resource and answer to your question, uh, and she has been here is and not only I think she's UCC, Marie Fortune. Yes, she's UCC. Her books uh, are just fascinating about um, clergy abuse okay. and how she handles it. So that's a wonderful yes, resource. That's a good resource. And, and she has videos. Marie no. Fortune. Marie yeah. Fortune. Yeah. Marie C. Fortune. Yeah. But I learned something from my sister Gail Richuti uh, years ago. And I just state it because I, I was stunned when she said it. The Divinity School, BB, before Barbara we worked here, had <laughs> <laughs> a workshop about preaching and domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Remember Gail? Mm -hmm. So they asked me to come, like I've had all this experience. And Gail, <laughs> never had your church, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, I gave, I talked about how Gail said, we must be careful when we preach, Remember this? because the way in which you preach from the pulpit, mm -hmm. the abuser is sitting next to his wife. Mm -hmm. yes. And he may go home and say, you told her, didn't you? Mm -hmm. I yeah. never thought of that until she enlightened me, which says to me there are ways to do <coughs> this in a sensitive way so that the congregation knows you understand. Um, but in the balcony of that spouse's mind, she had betrayed him to Gail. It's a stunning revelation for me. But Marie Fortune is excellent. Yeah, she's great. Any other thoughts about the culture of violence in this? Or you want another question? Real quick on the global uh, point that he raised. In a global sense, we as a nation have been hypocritical. Mm -hmm. You know, we can, uh, we will intercede when it meets our economic 
goals. Yeah. Yeah. So when we decided we were going to go in Afghanistan, part of our going was the Taliban, they don't educate the girls. Or more recently, we've had this issue with um, the kidnapping of the girls in Africa. These aren't things that they just started doing yesterday. These are thousands of years of culture that we just ignore until it meets something we want to address because we want oil or we want coal or we want some resource that's in that nation. And so the point is that we're very hypocritical in that regard. And then at home, we do have a culture of violence that I don't think you can fathom the things that myself, Cindy, Mr. McMickle, that we've been exposed to relative to why someone will hurt somebody else. Minuscule. You know, I stood up and talked about my shoes. There are people who have died for stepping on somebody's shoes. The issue of uh, clergy abuse has become huge in the, in the Catholic Church. And, you know, I, I think it was, um, it was a real uh, wake-up call to the regular, loyal, good Catholics who go to church every Sunday and listen to Father. And uh, it's an evil thing, but it's given birth to a huge amount of laity consciousness in terms of we, these men also suffer from how we put them up on a pedestal and treat them you know, as if they are very, very special and very different from all other men and all other people. And so many groups have got together and there's been so many protests about the silencing uh, of this abuse by the leadership, by the bishops, uh, that the laity are beginning, little by little, to come into their own. They're beginning to ask questions and to demand accountability and answers that they, they never even thought of before. So again, it's, it's a, a matter of consciousness. We are a sleeping, violent nation. You know, we, we let the violence go on around us. And, you know, but when something really, really hits us, and we're alerted to, to the degree of violence involved in it, and we begin to think about it to be more conscious, then the shift begins and we can see, well, there are changes. Maybe we need to get rid of it. We won't do this again. And we get bishops apologizing. So for the first time in, in our history, I think, we are finding men in leadership who are realizing that, uh, you know, there's been this, these huge cover-ups and guess what? That the people have found out. And, and therefore, things must change. And it's the same with domestic violence, it's the same with battery, it's the same with prostitution. We've been covering up these issues that we haven't wanted to deal with or were even conscious of. And in a way, they have to. The boil has to burst. Uh, and it's a sickening thing to see it happening. But when it does, there can be you know, the beginning of healing. Two questions, if I may. One, how much domestic violence is alcohol related? And secondly, in terms of uh, male, positive male role models, how do we face the problem of male children, young people growing up in single family uh, relationships, mostly mothers? Anybody here to take that on? Well, I, I can share with you that across the board, Jimmy may want to weigh in on it, but across the board, um, <coughs> Chef, you may want to give some feedback on it. Uh, about 89% uh, of all arrests come into custody under some sort of uh, uh, drug, whether it's alcohol and alcohol and or drugs. That's, that's, that's for all arrestees. Now, within that, um, and I'm a little skeptic, this is me personally, but that alcohol is going to encourage you to do something you otherwise would not have done. Um, and there's a, I can't, I won't even go there. There's a saying, something about how alcohol merely um, brings something that's already there to the surface. But there's a smart comeback for it. I, I can't remember it. I'm going to have to write that down. But, um, but, but 
I'm, I'm skeptical that that someone who doesn't drink or is no longer a drinker will no longer abuse. Um, it's and this is based on my experience. You know, a lot of some of that's research or some of the school work or research work I've done. But I, I yeah, there's yeah, it, it's sort of it's there, and then the alcohol just makes it easier to come out. If, if I could put that in simplified terms, but you may want to weigh in from. Oh, it's good. It's a, it doesn't cause it. So the alcohol doesn't cause it. So domestic violence is power and control over one person over another, period. And we talk about the complexities of, uh, you know, that people don't believe the victim because he's so charming. And I use he, but again, there are male victims, but that majority are men, uh, women, that he is so kind and loving to everybody else. So he's beloved. And I will tell you, in this role at ABW, people who I've worked with professionally disclose to me as safe space, and it's such a gift when they do, uh, and you just, it amazes me, it's just this close all around us. So every suburb, every place, everywhere. So it's not the alcohol, it's not uh, because they were abused as children. I mean, you know the awful tragedy in Rockport, Alex Kogut, 18 year old girl murdered by her boyfriend. Was he drinking that night? Yes, but he had a history of abuse with prior girlfriends. It wasn't because he drank. And he was also very loving and kind in class, right? So in terms of power and control, domestic violence is strategic. It's over time, and it's targeted of one partner to another. Alcohol may make the choice a little bit easier to do it, but it's not related to, to alcohol. Uh, and that's research-based, uh, and that's part of it. We run into a, a problem when we make that the excuse, yes. and there is no excuse. So going, again, Ray Rice is just because people know it, um, but did they drink that night? Yes, but do we think that that, that was a choice that was made in the moment? Did alcohol help it? Maybe, but that really was that person's individual makeup. And that's a great uh, point you raised relative to positive role models, particularly in the dearth of single mothers raising young boys. You have to have some positive influence in that boy's life for him to grow up to be a man. And I think that's where we uh, lost a lot of ground is that we have boys who are being raised to be men by other boys, by who's in the neighborhood. So it's not a matter of, of somebody outstanding, whether it's in the clergy or in the police department or some other in the school district. They're not in play. These young men, I, if you go into a school and you go to an elementary school, you'll see young kids that get along great. And then they hit a certain age where the influence is no longer, say, their mother or the school teacher, it's their friend on, on, on the street, and all of a sudden, boom, the expectations change. And so that uh, when we talk about violence, a lot of times kids become violent because if they don't respond violently, they're a punk. And that is what's fed to them is, oh, you're gonna let them say that to you? You're gonna let them do that to you? If it were me, I'd punch them in his face. Boom, you start to do those things. And the same thing with your girlfriend. Oh, she went out and she didn't tell you she was going out? I wouldn't tolerate that. Boom, and it starts to creep. And if it's something that you experience in the home, it even starts earlier. Um, you know, this whole notion of um, nature versus nurture, you know, I think that I am, I am the single mother of one of the most threatened species on our planet, a young black male who's six foot five, and I've had him since he was three years old. And let me tell you, when I talk to you about my work on the streets or in Africa or wherever, there's been nothing more challenging for me as a single woman than to bring up my little boy into now a very large, big African-American young man. It's been a, a, a tremendous challenge right from the very beginning. Because my son was born with the, you know, as a crack baby. He was born with addictions. He was born with, I believe, inherited violence. So I've lived with this violence uh, to the degree that my son was taken away for a year um, for violence and put in a, a special home. But you know, 
he's now 22 and we, we've got through it. We've got through it and I believe uh, it, it was my, my real faith, you know, that no matter where you've been, no matter what you've inherited, no matter how many drugs you've been on, you know, there is always, there is always a way, there is always hope. And for me, the answer has been really, uh, love this child to death. You know, let him, I love you, I love you. I say it all the time. I love you. And he says, okay, mom, I love you too. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, well, why do you give me a kiss? Oh, well, uh, well, give me 10 bucks. Uh, okay, I'll give you. You know, I mean, but he knows fundamentally that I love him. And we've survived. I know that if that child, if that baby had remained on the south side of Chicago in those projects, he would either now be dead or he would certainly be in jail for life. So there is something, there is something that we as a Christian community, we as believers, no matter what the challenge we face and how long it lasts, you know, we just, we just must not give up. There are many reasons why people are violent. My son was, was loved and loved from three days old and was violent. Right up until, well, 16, basically. But the thing is, I, I had to love him through all of that and to tell him I know, you know, he knew, he knew I loved him. And he, and he still does. did a vigil around that um, and came to me and said, wow, I grew up in a church, I never knew that there was other people who had been, other girls who had been sexually abused. I thought I was the only one. All I ever heard about my church was abstinence. And so I would sit in these youth meetings as a teenager and feel so dirty because I, she was raped when she was six. And she said, so I knew I wasn't a virgin, so I wasn't abstinent, so you know, she grew up in the church just feeling dirty, different, never talking, there was never open space to have that conversation. You know, so I say to, especially youth ministers, you know, bring someone in if you don't want to talk about it yourself, but create conversations with the teenagers because guess what? Probably about 25, 30% of the girls, teens sitting there have been abused or being abused. 
So, you know, to not talk about it is like pretending. We're not again dealing with reality. We have those conversations. Pardon me? How do we get that silence over this whole thing? Oh, it's our, our culture. We're socialized, you know, um, as the chief said, right? So that's just. That's how we're brought up, you know, that's how girls in my, I'm older, so my generation, we, I was brought up in all Catholic schools, and being nice was really important, right? Being polite. You know, I think it's hard that if someone is crossing a boundary, even a physical boundary with you, you know, I'm teaching my daughter, you know, you just can't say no in a loud voice, or say, no, I don't want that hug, thank you, mm -hmm. right? We have to socialize our girls that way, that no, is okay, um, but that's just, but historically that's not how we've socialized our girls, and certainly not in the church have we socialized women. Uh, so we need to empower them to speak up and to be strong. I mean, and there's so many different ways we can have churches shift. I walked into a church that's in uh, Boston. I, I had never been in there. I was there to meet the pastor for some reason. And he said, oh, can you wait a few minutes? I said, sure. Within the first five minutes, I was in that church waiting for him. I thought to myself, this is a safe church because I saw on the bulletin board something about a battered woman's shelter. I saw some fundraiser event. I went into the ladies' room. I closed the door. There's a sticker. If you've been hurt or abused, you can call pastor so-and-so, woman pastor. And when I met him, I said, wow, you've got a really good, you've got a safe church here. He said, what do you mean? I said, within five minutes, I would feel coming in if I was joining your church, this is a place maybe I could talk about it. Right? That message was all over the place in that church. There's some really little things churches can do to create an atmosphere that this is a safe place to talk about it. And we do talk about it. In the pastor, I had a pastor once say, Oh, I don't need to talk about that, but isn't that obvious? And I'm like, No, it's not obvious at all. Get up and talk about it um, and preach about it. So they're in network um, with the resources that are out there. So I'd be happy to talk more. Okay, just real quick, I wanted to offer, um, for if you have a place that you want to put signs, we, we put them all over town. So Alternatives for Battered Women, so we have our 24-hour confidential hotline. Uh, we have posters, so if you go to the bathroom here, and I love it, they have a whole thing about uh, breast health, right? So that's fabulous. Uh, but there's also the ability to put up signs about your domestic violence hotline, and we provide that to you for free. And we have palm cards, which we can put out. We love to put them in the bathrooms versus, as we talked about, not being so visible, uh, but having it in a safe space. Um, and we honestly, we actually also have mail files with our hotline number on it, so we keep it in their purse. Um, and we found that was very, very helpful. And often when we put it out, we'll put it out in like a candy bowl, and we'll see people take the candy and grab the hotline at the same time. So it's really subtle, and those opportunities are there. Um, we also partner with Sarah Line. If you've heard of Sarah Line, which is um, the Jewish uh, Federation hosts that hotline specifically for other Jewish women to call them. And that's during business hours, and at night it rolls over to ABW. So that was a specific cultural response and a religious response to their needs within their community, and then we partnered with them. So, so I'm afraid we've uh, run out of time for many more questions. And we would hope some answers to go with them, and I think folks are going to be available for a moment or two afterward. Can I, can I mention quickly that I, I read Fifty Shades. I was late to the party, and uh, I thought it was pretty good. I'm not, you know, really, I'm, not, I'm not making light of her concerns, but I've said all along, I'm about a woman making her own choices, and a formal woman making her own choices. And there was a woman, uh, Dom, I think it's called? Yeah. There was a woman down in there, so that kind of, yeah. Bad joke. I did want to just offer thanks to our panelists. Paraphrase Bonhoeffer, we can speak out, we can assist those who need it, and we can resist. And this is not really an attempt to sell books, but we have some wonderful examples speaking out across the gender side, a theological response to global violence against women and girls. Assist those who need it. I hear a seed growing by Edwina uh, Gateway. Thank you, Mr. Colby Gwaltney. 
and resist preaching the Advent season. Our voices cannot be silenced. So until there is no need for safe places to escape to, we thank you for being those safe places and hope we can be from those kids. Thanks for having us. And, uh, before you make your way to the chapel for the closing worship, we just want to, again, thank you for being here for Lecture Week and to remind you that the Save the Date for next spring's Lecture Week are already out there. Our theme is God's Time is Now. Recultivating the garden, tending creation as people of faith. And so we invite you for an engaging week to discuss how we can recultivate the garden. Uh, there's also other materials out there about our programs here at CRCDS, and I'd like to invite my colleague, Melissa Morrow, to just take a moment. Probably most of you have heard this pitch already this week, but I just want to remind you again that you don't need to wait until lecture week to have these kinds of conversations with us. Um, our, our curriculum is rich with opportunities to discuss um, social issues or a variety of social issues and how they intersect with faith. Um, so I just invite you to stop by the table and talk to me if you're interested in auditing a class or taking one for credit. Thanks, Melissa. Please do fill out your evaluation form. And please join us for chapel. And can I just take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Barbara Moore, our director of women and gender studies.